All right. Welcome to another uh, session of V Brown Bag. Um, tonight on V Brown Bag, we are going to be taking another step in our IT career series. Um, and tonight we're going to be talking about fun with AWS step functions with Sean Doyle. Um, so a couple of show notes that I have for you guys. Um, if you want to get in on the conversation, um, you can tweet at us at V Brown Bag. Um, we will be watching that throughout the show. You can share your questions um, either in over via Twitter or through the ask a question function in the Zoom webinar. Um, if you'd like to follow our guests, you can find Sean Doyle at, at Cloud Osmotic on Twitter. And if you'd like to follow me, the host tonight, my name is Signe Englert, and you can follow me at Signe Englert. Um, and with that, I will hand the screen share over to our guest, Sean. Thanks. Thanks, Signe. Um, so let me bring this up here. All right, so we are going to have some fun with AWS step functions today. Um, before we get into it, uh, who 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 is who am I? Who is this guy that's talking to you out there right now? So um, I'm a principal cloud consultant. Um, I have ten AWS certifications, and I've also contributed to the AWS specialty certifications. Um, so I'm a specialty subject matter expert there. Also a former AWS APN ambassador and APN AIML black belt. Um, I say former because these are partner programs and I recently just changed partners, AWS partners. So I have, I have to wait a little bit until I can rejoin those programs. Um, I love riding bikes, I love pancakes and I love coffee. So uh, it's a little bit about who I am. Um, you can follow me at Cloud Osmotic on Twitter and then my LinkedIn handle is Sean Doyle 88 if you want to find out more about me, but it's not about me today. It's about AWS step functions. So what is what are AWS step functions? AWS step functions is a fully managed service. Um, it, it lets you coordinate components of distributed applications and microservices using visual workflows. Uh, it's really cool because you can once you set up this workflow, um, it essentially acts like, sort of like, you know, sort of like a pipeline in a way, right? So once automation kicks off, it goes through this workflow and there is various state um, tasks, they're known as tasks or states in the workflow. Um, and you can see this all happening in, re in real time. And, and there's, we're gonna talk about the two different types of step functions uh, that you can choose from. Um, and I only have about four slides uh, and then we're actually gonna go in and I'll, I'm gonna show you you know, in the console and, and, and other, other things um, more about that because I'm a visual learner and I'm an interactive learner. So, you know, I don't wanna just talk to power, you know, slides for this whole conversation. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna actually see, see this uh, firsthand here. So uh, another cool thing about step functions is it can actually help minimize your code. So if you are utilizing step functions to perform, you know, a lot of times, you know, if you have a Lambda function or, or other serverless microservice, you may need that service to invoke other AWS services. And you may have multiple ser lam uh, Lambda functions that do this. Well, you can maybe, you know, it could be possible to take that code away, take a little bit of that complexity away from your code and then move it to step functions and have it defined in a declarative format rather than in your, you know, in your, uh, in your code base. So um, there's multiple use cases for step functions. Um, so as the part of the demo that I'll be showing today is part of the, part of the solution that I did for my AWS AI ML black belt. Um, so I created an ETL process using AWS Lambda and, and some various Python libraries um, to do just some data science preparation work. So, you know, extract, transform, load, and then normalizing the data after it's extracted, transformed, and loaded. Um, but you can also use this to do, you know, some microservice and serverless orchestration. Um, you can, you know, host whole web apps if you want or or do security and IT automation again it's it's all with the power of AWS it can be all be chained together so i could have 
you know, a, an event bridge event kick off a workflow. So if somebody, you know, let's, for example, let's say somebody tries to remove a sensitive um, security group rule or, or security group, or tries to add a permissive security group rule, that could trigger a, a, a step function um, that has a few lambdas in it that goes through some logic, some business logic, and says, okay, well, is this permitted or not? And what we'll see um, with step function, and I should say, um, oh, sorry, let me get back to where we were. I'm just going to pull this website up. So I've included these links so I could take you to some of the the actual documentation from AWS because they have great examples. So, you know, for the security and IT automation uh, workflow, right? So I could have an Amazon event bridge trigger, invoke my step function that takes a look at some, you know, that has a Lambda function that looks at some policy. And, you know, let's just say, okay, well, maybe, maybe we want to temporarily remove that policy. And with AWS step functions, Similar to AWS Simple Workflow, um, which is another AWS service, you can actually have the state machine wait for a human response or another system response. So you can send something to, you know, an entity, and that entity, you know, it could be in the form of an email, right? And the email has like a yes, approve, or no, deny, or 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 you know no, I don't approve link, two different links. And those links could link to an API gateway that then delivers it to another Lambda that says, okay, did they approve or did they deny? If they approved, then I go one way. If they deny, then I go another way. So um, it could be really powerful uh, for that specific reason. So AWS Step Functions uses what's called the Amazon state language. It's a JSON based definition for the state machine. Um, and as I just mentioned, you can, um, you can define your step functions to not just automate things in AWS, but also you know, wait for um, external entities to respond. And, and how they respond is they wait for a task token. So, um, excuse me. Um, and, and there's different types of states and tasks that you can have. So you, uh, so these are the, the the various types. These are the various types of states and tasks. And, and I'll show you a bit more of what these look like when we get to the demo. So there's two types of step functions, and, and I just put in some examples here. And I'll click the link, and we'll take a look at the at least the visual workflow of it. Um, so there's a standard tasks, or I'm sorry, a standard step function. And this is really for long running tasks. Um, AWS documentation has, you know, more comparison differences between the two. Um, but this is really for long running tasks and this supports um, the sync operation and the wait for task token. So this supports that external, you know, involvement inside of the state machine. Express is really short lived um, running tasks. And this is ideal for high volume. In fact, so there's a, I, I believe it's limitations per second um, of state transitions. So, so there's a limit on the standard, but there's no limit on the express. And this is really for like, you know, if your state machine is responding to things from IOT or something with a lot of streaming data, right? So you'd have a lot of streaming data coming in. You're gonna have a lot of um, short, fast state machines executing. Um, so, so at, just to provide some examples, you know, Amazon has a order and payment processing express workflow example here. So we'll take a look at this link and let me zoom in a little bit. So you can see here, this is sort of, you know, um, if your application had a payment processing, uh, workflow, for example. So you would start at this choice um, state. It's a choice because it has a branch between this, between 
various other states. So you, have, you receive an approve order request, and then if it's something you want to, you know, you can move to, down to this notify order success and process the payment. And if there's failures, you can go down to these failure tasks, and maybe there's some other task in, below that that says, you know, send an email or notification or trigger something else. Um, so this is sort of what it looks like uh, for an express workflow. And th this is just another example of a workflow with, you know, um, human, you know, human inter intervention or human interaction. So you could have a Lambda function that checks stock prices regularly and another, you know, maybe that Lambda function passes the stock price information to another Lambda function and that Lambda function is generating some buy and sell recommendations, which gets sent to a human via email, via SNS, via text message, something and waits for the you know for the human to say buy or sell and then depending on what the human chooses it's a choice to go to the buy function you know to the buy function or the sell function um, so just an example here now there's other you know more advanced uh implementations of this so uh you can you can work in things such as retries um parallel executions so, um, you know, if, if, for example, in this, in this example, you could have this buy, if we say that this buy stock is a function, um, we could have a retry. So what happens if the buy stock function fails? Well, we could have a retry branch here and retry something else. Maybe it's another function, maybe it's the same function. Um, or if we, you know, we could potentially, instead of just buying the stock, maybe we want to buy the stock, and you know, at the same time, we want to do I don't I don't know something else with the stock. Check the market again. Check check the stock price immediately at the same time that I buy the stock. We could actually have this be a parallel execution where we have two of these states running side by side before they get to the report. So so there's you know, um, it's definitely exten extensible there. And now we'll do it. Now we're now we're going to do it live. We did it a little bit live, but we're gonna we're gonna go into the console and we're gonna take a look at this at at this at at everything in the environment. So um, I have I am in an AWS account, um, and in this account I've deployed a CloudFormation stack, a nested stack that uh, deploys a network, some S3 buckets, and the um, state machine. Um, and so inside of the state machine, we have um, the the state machine here that, that we've set up. Now I want to just show we can create a state machine. And here's the standard or express state machines. And, and AWS is really good. They give you a lot of information here. So if you just click this drop down, they actually tell, you know, they, they line up side by side here, you know, the differences between the two, so you so you can take a look at this if you're if you're just you know you need to make a decision there. Um, you can run a sample project, uh, just as an example, or you can start with a template. And these templates are really good. They give you um, examples of how to write, uh, use the various states. So you know here's an example of a retry failure and. Um, Uh, I'm sorry, I think there's a, a catch failure. I think this is what we want to take a look at. So you can have a, a function run here, and then you have, you know, some, some error fallback here, some other reserve type fallback, and a catch all fallback. So you can actually handle errors from your function. If you didn't get the result from the function you want, you can have, you know, various error paths, right? Just like you would in code, um, except you're moving it you want to be able to move complex error handling to state machines, but you could, you know, handle errors within the overall workflow between your functions. Um, as mentioned, you know, there's a parallel um, execution branch. I'm going to close that. And so this is what I was waiting, mentioning here. So we can have parallel execution branches here. Um, in the in the state machine as well. 
So multiple, multiple options. Um, the state machine that we're going to be working with only, you know, doesn't use any of the parallelism. It does use a lot of choices. Um, so we're going to take a look at the definition here. Um, and so, so here is the state machine that, uh, the sample state machine that, that, that I've created for this demonstration here. Um, so you have to specify a state to start at. And in this particular example, we're starting at the exact extract, transform, and load state. Um, and you can see here, it, it's really nice because there's a gra graphical visualization right next to the uh, state language JSON, um, which makes it really nice and, and, and pretty straightforward to work with when you're, when you're trying to evaluate or, or trying to make edits here. Um, so this extra, extract, transform, and load state is a type of task. The, the task is using a Lambda invocation. Um, I'm passing it a function name and I'm, I'm providing some payload. And so the payload is actually gonna be coming from the invocation of the state machine. Um, so to do that, I just I just use this um, the symbol the, the dollar sign symbol here, and then after that I say okay well what's next what comes next it it goes through this um, the next state of ETL success and this is a choice state so you can have multiple choices right now I have two you know is and I so this lambda function is actually returning values to the state machine and I and, and as in as, with the form of a dictionary. So I am opening up that dictionary here and I'm getting, you know, a key of status, which is a Boolean. So that's why I'm saying Boolean equals true. And if that's true, then I'm gonna go to this, this um, the next state, which is yes. And if it's false, then I'm gonna go to the next state of no. And I'm setting a default here of no. So the only way I, the only way I can go down this success pass is if it comes back as true. Um, so, so, you know, just a little bit of overview there about this. And the nice thing here is this updates in real time. So uh, if I, or maybe, it, no, I have to edit it. So if I edit this and I change next to something else, like, uh, no, you can see it just, it, it updates the, the picture at the same time. So, um, and if I update the name of the task, that will also update, but you'll receive an error. And it's really good at pointing out like, hey, you have an error here. Um, you know, this, this is nowhere to be found in the, in the state language. So you don't have to do everything in the console either. Um, actually, there is a really cool extension. Got a little Visual Studio code sometimes. There's a really cool extension. Um, by Paul Shestikoff called AWS Step Functions uh, Constructor. And so my step functions are defined in a CloudFormation template, but I, you know, I can work out an outside of that template um, as just a JSON file. And if I run show step function, it'll actually show me this in my editor. So I can make changes in here, just like I can in AWS and I can see these. And actually this is a little bit, this is interactive. So if I click on these, um, so for example, if I click on this choice of yes, uh, if you watch this line here, 33 through 35, I can say, I can change this to be, you know, next is no. And it actually updates it here on the left as well. So I can choose to, you know, visually edit this, or I can choose to edit, edit it here, um, which is nice. And I don't remember what that value was. There it is. So I already ran um, a, a, a step step function. Um, I just ran it before before this event. So it gave it a name. It, the name is optional. You can name these, but if not, it just generates a random name. Um, and what's really nice here is it. it 
when you're actually running this, actually, I will kick off another one. I'm just going to kick it off manually to save time here. So just kick off manually. So it just provides it a random name. Um, this is uh, the input payload, and this is also optional, so you don't necessarily need this. But you know, for example, if you had things coming in from EventBridge or S3 or something like that, um, you know, your your state machine could see that as input data, and you know, use that within the flow. So, what's really nice is if you start the execution, it actually goes through this in real time. So this is constantly being updated, and you can see down here. Uh, your execution event history. So, you know, this is, you know, it started, it entered this state, it started this task, and it shows you here's the link to the Lambda, here's the link to the CloudWatch logs, here's the execution time, or sorry, here's here's when the execution started, and here's the current running ex elapsed time for the state. Um, so you can see this, it's still running. This is gonna update, you know, as this this is gonna update. And, and if anything fails, you know, you have this color coded thing here, right? Where, you know, something fails, you can see that. And something succeeds, you can see that. And even if it fails, it's gonna run down, you know, if you have a failure path, it's gonna run run down that, that path. So um, let's go back to the other one though. Um, and we, so if you click on the states, it gives you more, it gives you a easier, you know, visually easier way to interpret what's happening, right? So inside of my state language, I said, this is the start state um, or the start task. Uh, and as input, you can see here, I have my input payload. And it tells me my output. So here, you know, here is my payload, which I had defined inside of my step function. I had that payload. Um, so if we scroll up to, so the extract, transform, and load, it's going. The next state is ETL success. So the output of this is going to be the input of this. And inside of here, I'm looking for something from the ETL task payload status, which you can see is the output of my, that's the output that my Lambda function gave me. So ETL task payload status. I could have looked for something else. I could have looked for this. I could have looked for this. But you know, simple Boolean is going to be easier when working with something like this. But down here for the SNS message, um, you know, I could have I could have wrote a message and just had my function output the message into this payload or into a new payload and said, okay, in this state, as your input, you know, right here I'm just saying completed equals true, but this could have been a message and then had the SNS task take that message and send it out to somebody. Instead, I just hard coded the message because, um, well, long story. Um, but if I I open this. And the nice thing again, so see, see with this, the nice thing is, is I can, once this is set up, then my workflow is defined. And at that point I can just, it's hands off really, right? Especially if it's automated with EventBridge. So in this example, I am looking inside of a bucket for a specific object. But if I had that tied to EventBridge, I wouldn't have to come in here and trigger this at all. I could just upload my object to S3, which would trigger an event bridge, uh, or or even I think you can I think you can have S3 be an input trigger for step functions. But either way, whether you're using event bridge or if you can use you know S3 put object as an as a trigger here, I could just in I could just put my object into S3. This would kick off in the background. I wouldn't even have to do anything, and eventually I would know whether it worked or not because I would get an email saying, hey, your ETL task has been completed and data has been rich for ML model training, or sorry, your task failed. You know, please 
here's some debug output, go, go figure it out, right? Um, so it's really nice because you know I don't have to worry about all the backend pieces of the of the flow anymore after I get it set up and working properly. So, um, yeah. So that is the that is an overview of the AWS uh, Ceph functions. Is there any questions or anything like that? Um, I'm just going to double check, double, double check Twitter. I don't see any in the chat or the Q and A just yet. But um, I mean, a question I think I would have shot. So this is this is very fascinating to me. So I I do not come from an AWS or coding background, um, but I do do a lot of automation that is achieve that is achieving a very similar thing to this within Salesforce. And of course, there's quite a few there's quite a few more, uh, I guess, training wheels, so to speak, that are built into those processes, because it's very, it's very, they did they, they try to make it as codeless as possible, as point as click and possible as possible, but getting to see under the hood um, here, which is, you know, where, which I'm almost certain it's do, achieving a very similar thing with the code that I, that, that goes unseen, that this is very interesting to me to get to, to see what's going on. And I guess, um, in terms of like, like, how, and this is maybe not a, like this is maybe too like too broad of a question as well. Feel free to like push me harder if if it is, like for um. So I can also come from a small like a small IT shop in general. Um, how would you say like if, if you were thinking of like initial steps? So like we're a small business, we just got our AWS up and running, um, and let's say we're setting up um, an e-commerce system that we built in house. Um, how much you use AWS kind of to help you out with some of these automations? I mean, I, I can already see, I, I, I can imagine like how some of this would already be applicable in terms of like ordering, or like like you, I think you showed, already showed like an e-commerce uh, um, uh, like example. Um, what kind of like what what's what would the lift be for for to actually like get this rolling? That's a good question. Um, it depends on the. Uh, I, I guess it sort of depends on what the uh, development level is of the of the organization. So, how much development are they doing in house versus how much you know, how much they're running, you know, common off the shelf software. Mm -hmm. um, this is really geared more towards automating you know, either your AWS workflows or, or serverless workflows, um, because, because it really, the, the power really shines from using it with Lambda um, and other AWS services. Mm -hmm. And so if they, if a e-commerce organization was developing their sort of like their own e-commerce application, then this would be a perfect fit because they could be able to, it would help them be able to organize the workflow for that, you know, that that portion. Uh, you know, a lot of times invocations of Lambda, so Lambdas can invocate other Lambdas, but you have to be careful of sort of an infinite invocation cycle where Lambda just keeps invocating Lambda and Lambda keeps in. So, and, and then not only that, but you know, Lambdas are uh, asynchronous. So if I invocate a Lambda, um, and and you, if I invocate a lambda and you invocate a lambda, you know how does that and that lambda needs to talk to three other lambdas? With you know, there's there's methods to handle this, but doing it inside of the lambda inside of the code itself to have like okay, I'm 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 now entering this lambda execution, I'm running through the code. And now I need in the inside of my code, I'm executing another Lambda and I'm having this Lambda sleep for a while until this Lambda is done to give me back my payload. And then I'm, then I'm continuing the code. Like that's a lot trickier to handle and it's a lot more error prone than say setting up something like this where you know, I can have very specific, following the, the, following the principle of, um, you know, oh, it's eluding me right now. Uh, one job, or will kiss, and and also every every you know, every block of code has one job. Every class has one. Every every function has one job. Like try to make it as you know, where your 
you know, your function block or your, or your class or whatever is it's really just doing one thing, keeping mm -hmm. it simple. And so, you know, by in, in, in that vein, right. So I could have had my ETL Lambda also run some normalizations, but that would be a giant Lambda. That would be hard to update. That would be hard to iterate on. That would be hard to improve. So instead I just broke it up, right? These two things, while they use like similar libraries, they're, they're, they're doing different functions. So they should be different functions. Um, in fact, that's actually brings up a, a great point. Really cool thing that happens that happened at uh, reInvent was the announcements of um, container image support for Lambda. So these state, these Lambda functions here are using Lambda layers. So I'm using an, an AWS, uh, AWS data wrangler, a pandas layer and a scikit-learn layer. Now the issue is, is that you can only have 50 megabytes. I believe the right, I believe the limit's still 50 megabytes uh, total Lambda layers on your function. And so what a Lambda layer allows you to do is it, it's, it's, it's essentially like, if you think of Python, um, if you think of Python, you have, you know, you import packages, right? And packages are common and you can shoot, you know, like if, if I import the JSON package, I can import that in any of my Python projects. Um, Lambda layers gives us that same capability. So I, it's essentially like writing a Python package that any of my Lambda functions can use. So I can import these into any Lambda function that I want. But the problem is, is that I can only have 50 megabytes of these libraries on my Lambda function, which is a problem because some layers like this pandas layer is very bloated. And there's a lot of things that this AWS Wrangler layer share with the pandas layer. So in order to get this to work, I actually had to go into the pandas inside when I was installing it, I had to say, don't install the dependencies, like don't install all those dependencies because those dependencies are already in this layer. Because if I didn't do that, it would be too big to fit. So where I'm going with all this is AWS at reInvent actually announced um, container image support for Lambda. So now you can build a, a container and instead of running it on a container orchestration platform like Kubernetes or like ECS, Elastic Kubernetes uh, Container um, Service, I can run in that container as a Lambda function so you combine that with step functions, right? And now instead of having, you know, the, uh, sorry. So this could be a, a Lambda function that's actually just running a container runtime. So I could have all of my packages and dependencies in there. This could be another one, or it could be the same one. It's just, this is doing a different function, but, uh, but I can use the same container image. Um, and the, and the neat thing about that is they actually allow up to 10 gig, I think it's 10 gigs of a container image, which is way bigger than the Lambda layer. So it's pretty nice. Um, I kind of like took your question and then- No, that was great. Totally that's down the rabbit hole fun. there. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, and I'm also in full full learning mode myself. So no, that, that's fantastic. You know, I totally addressed it. Um, so yeah, I am, let's see, I'm just gonna, I'm out hunting for any more questions. Um, doesn't look like we just have any more questions, but, um, I don't know if you are interested in continuing kind of just giving a little bit more of a tour around the, these features in AWS, which just, purely just cause I'm, I'm fascinated by it. <laughs> if there's anything else you want to show off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so again, you know, you have your state machine and you have the state, the, the, the execution of that state machine. So right now we're looking at a specific execution and you can see things, you know, about the input, the output. So this is at the very end. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of metadata here that you can, you know, send or, or parse and, and you know, for do things with that. And, and then you have your, your definition state here. So the, the neat thing about this too, is it, it doesn't just work with, I'm only using two AWS services here. So I'm just using Lambda and I'm using SNS. Um, but you know, the, it, it supports 
more than that. And, and it also supports, you know, as mentioned, um, human interaction. So um, just due to time uh, for, for what I had to get this done, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't include any model model training, like machine learning model training. But if I already had a model trained inside of AWS or outside of AWS, but hosted on SageMaker, um, or even not hosted on SageMaker, really, because if you had a model trained and that was running, you know, in a in a Kubernetes environment or something like that, you could have a Lambda invoke that endpoint if it was reachable. Um, but let's just say for sake of simplicity, because it's AWS and it's integrated, that we have a model running on SageMaker. I could have another task here that says, go kick off machine learning, right? So, and, and or, or I could have it say, send an SNS notification like you saw, right? That said, uh, oh, I lost that notification pop out. So send a notification that looks like this and then have, you know, do you want to train on this data set? Yes or no. And I could click yes. And so I could have a state here that's waiting for that response that then gets sent to an API gateway that gets sent to another Lambda function that says yes or no. Okay. He said, that, you know, he said, yes, let's go down the training route. Or he said, no, let's not go down the training route and just end. So you know, this can be extended even further here by putting on some, this is, this is just for the ETL process, but there's nothing stopping me from, from if I had a model that's, ho that's, that's already out there, I could add a step here to go update that model or, you know, replace the model with a new model trained from this new data. And that could be all like, you know, ML ops is becoming a very big thing, right? Like how do I automate, how do I automate training of my data models? How do I automate ETL, then training, then um, hosting, then rehost, you know, upgrading that model with new data? How do I make that easier and less friction for my data scientists? Step functions is a, is a great use case for this because again, if, if I had that extra state here, of train machine, you know, train model or, yeah, so I could have an extra state train model. Then, then the next task could be um, evaluate model against previous model. And you could have some logic there to say, you know, if new model is better than old model, replace old model with new model. Mm -hmm. And then send an send an invite or send an email, and that could com be completely automated. All the data scientists would have to do is just upload their new data to S3, and this would all just kick off on the back end, you know. And and eventually they would get an email or or a notification of some sort saying, "Hey, this thing was great, you know. Like I replaced your model with this new model, or this model was, you know, didn't didn't improve the the um." didn't improve the target metric. So we just, we just didn't do anything and mm -hmm. we're just still using the other model, but now you have a, now you have some, a new model like, or a new experiment that you can go and, and analyze further if, if you, if you would like. So um, it, yeah. So, so uh, it's pretty impressive. I think the possibilities here are very um, interesting because Again, it's sort of like, it's sort of like, so, you know, you think CI CD pipeline, right? Like I check code into, a, into my, into my, into CI, and then I have something that kicks off a CD process to various environments and it's running tests and it's doing all these things for software. But what about for orchestration of cloud services, right? Like this is like a pipeline for cloud services. So, you know, it's not necessarily like, it's not it's not one for one, but you know when you have like a when you want to have a workflow where you know because let's think about this in another way. What would happen if if I didn't have this set up, right? But I had these like lambda functions created. I would probably have you know a data analyst 
at the CLI or right, coming into the console, like go run extract, transform, and load function. And they'd have to sit there and wait. And then they'd have to say, okay, download results, upload to somewhere. Okay, now go and normalize the data. Download results, go upload somewhere. Like this, this takes that away, right? Like you don't need to do that anymore. And now they can focus on, you know, the model. They can focus on improving the ETL process. They can focus on new features and new engineer, new feature engineering, and new things in their data. Um, so it's pretty neat. Extremely. All right. Well, I am doing one final scan for questions or tweets this evening. Not seeing any at the moment. Um, so I think with that, we may conclude tonight's show. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming and giving us the crash course. I have personally found this absolutely fascinating, and I'm probably going to continue to pick your brain about it after the show as well. Um, for the sake of, sake of time and us getting to the weeds, I'll go ahead and... Uh, us down so yeah that was um so if you like what this recording will all will also be available on youtube um in the next couple of days if you'd like to catch up with the show again or get a rewatch um you can also again follow us at v brown bag anytime to catch the next show um and you can follow our our presenter tonight sean doyle at cloud osmotic on twitter and with that have a fantastic night absolutely i guess one one thing one encore piece just so I should mention it because I don't think a lot of people know about it is um, I used uh, what's called the AWS Data Wrangler library. And so people may be confused because at reInvent, they announced AWS Data Wrangler for SageMaker, which is in SageMaker Studio. But there's actually a Python SDK that they released prior to reInvent, I think in like August or September of, la of, the, of last year. Um, and it's 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 for working if you're working with data inside of AWS, this library is awesome, and the documentation is awesome. So uh, it makes it really easy to work with the AWS data services like Glue, like Redshift, like Athena. You can do this all in code using methods from this library, and so I highly recommend checking out the AWS Data Wrangler library it's 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 pretty neat um for example i'll just open up um just open up my lambda function here just as a quick example uh if we look at the code so the AWS Data Wrangler library acts sort of like pandas, but it also has um, a lot of hooks into AWS. So for example, here I'm setting a data frame and anybody who's worked with pandas library is familiar with setting a data frame. So I'm setting a data frame to read a CSV of data from S3. So here's the Wrangler, Data Wrangler. I just renamed it up here. Um, you know, I'm just importing AWS Wrangler as WR. Sorry about that. And so I'm just saying data frame, you know, AWS Wrangler S3, that's where my data is from, read CSV. Now I have a data frame, just like I would in Pandas. And with this same WR object, I can create a glue database with basically two lines of code. Um, with that same object, I can say, take the data frame that I just downloaded as a CSV, translate that to Parquet, Here's the S3 bucket I want to save it to. Uh, put that in a glue database with a table name of paste and raw. All within one, all within this, you know, short little, short little segment here. So I don't have to like run Bodo3 to set up a glue database and then kick off like a, you know, um, a, a glue crawler or anything like that. This this one thing, this one short little line, short little segment here can do all of that for you. Um, so it's, it's super handy. You can also query Athena. You can also work with Redshift. Um, and the, like I said, the documentation is, is really, really, it's really good. So at least I found it easy to understand. So, and with that, uh, that's all that. That's, that's just wanted to point that out in case anybody's Fantastic. Yes, we will. In. Yeah, we can include the link for that too in the, in the, the YouTube post, uh, post as well. That's great.
All right. I yeah. hope you all have a fantastic night. And again, you can come find that on YouTube um, in the next couple of days. Thanks so much.